Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. Today we reach the seventh episode in our third series of Way of the Fathers. We're entering the cities of the ancient world to learn what they were like as the gospel arrived in their streets and homes. Today we're moving to the edge of the Roman Empire. We're going to the city of Edessa in Upper Mesopotamia, and we'll begin with the story of its king. King Abgar was a sick man, and the best doctors in the world couldn't do a thing for him. But there were stories circulating about a man in Judea who could cure anything, even death. Desperate for help, the king wrote or dictated a letter and sent it off in the hands of his most trusted minister. This is what he said, Abgar Ukama to Jesus, the good physician, who has appeared in the country of Jerusalem. My Lord, peace, I have heard of you and of your healing, that it is not by medicines and roots that you heal, but by your word you open the eyes of the blind, you make the lame to walk, cleanse the lepers, and make the deaf to hear. And unclean spirits and lunatics, and those tormented, you heal them by your word, you also raise the dead. And when I heard of these great wonders you do, I decided in my mind that either you are God, who have come down from heaven and do these things, or you are the Son of God, who do all these things. Therefore, I have written to request of you to come to me who adore you, and to heal the disease I have, as I believe in you. This also I have heard, that the Jews murmur against you and persecute you, and even seek to crucify you, and contemplate treating you cruelly. I possess one small and beautiful city, and it is big enough for both of us to live in it in peace. He sent that letter off to Jerusalem with his archivist, who was also his chief painter, a man named Hanan. Hanan found the famous Jesus staying at the house of Gamaliel, a leader of the Jews. And the story tells us how Jesus responded. When Jesus received the letter at the house of the chief of the Jews, he said to Hanan, the keeper of the archives, Go and say to your Lord who has sent you to me, Blessed are you who, although you have not seen me, believe in me. For it is written of me, those who see me will not believe in me, and those who do not see me will believe in me. But as to what you have written to me, that I should come to you, That for which I was sent here is now finished, and I am going up to my Father who sent me, and when I have gone up to him, I will send you one of my disciples, who will cure the disease you have and restore you to health, and he will convert everyone with you to everlasting life. Your city shall be blessed, and no enemy shall again become master of it forever. Hanan wrote down Jesus' words, then... Being a skillful painter, he whipped out his brush and paint box and painted a lifelike portrait of Jesus to bring back to the king. And when Abgar the king saw the likeness, the story tells us, he received it with great joy and placed it with great honor in one of his palatial houses. Hanan, the keeper of the archives, related to him everything he had heard from Jesus. After Jesus had ascended to heaven, his promise was kept. The Apostle Thomas sent Thaddeus, or Adai, one of the seventy who had been sent out by Jesus, to heal Abgar's disease, and Thaddeus taught the way to Abgar and all his people. Well, this is the story the people of Edessa believed about the beginning of Christianity in their city. The version we've just heard comes from the doctrine of Adai the Apostle, a Syriac document that most scholars today date to about 400. But we know that the basic story is much older than that. We find it in the Greek-speaking historian Eusebius, who wrote almost a century earlier. 
and gives a similar wording for the correspondence between Abgar and Jesus, although Eusebius' version doesn't include the prophecy that the city will never be conquered. That prophecy, however, would become one of the great treasures of the city. As we'll hear later, the people of Edessa inscribed it on the city gates, and they relied on it as their main defense. Well, as we've seen more than once, the things people believe tell us a lot about history, even if the things themselves aren't true. In this case, the fact that people in Edessa believed their king had corresponded with Christ himself, and the fact that they pointed to the documents in the archives as proof, shows that they believed their Christianity was very ancient. It wouldn't have been possible for them to believe that unless there had been Christians in Edessa for quite a long time. At the very least, longer than anyone alive could remember, and probably longer than their parents or grandparents could remember. Eusebius tells us that the correspondence could be found in the archives at Edessa. He said, You have written evidence of these things taken from the archives of Edessa, which was at that time a royal city. For in the public registers there, which contain accounts of ancient times and the acts of Abgar, these things have been found preserved down to the present time. But there is no better way than to hear the epistles themselves, which we have taken from the archives and have literally translated from the Syriac language. Now Eusebius was not in the habit of lying about his sources, so we can believe him when he says the letters were in the archives at Edessa. In this case, we have independent confirmation. In the late 300s, a woman named Egeria, or Etheria, from the West, uh, probably from what is now Portugal or France, she wrote a journal of her pilgrimage to the East, a trip that included Edessa, where she also saw the letters between Abgar and Jesus. She reports that, quote, the letter is kept with great reverence at the city of Edessa. Eusebius doesn't mention the picture painted by Hanan. That picture would later become a big part of the legend. In later versions, it was a miraculous image made without hands, and it was one of the chief glories of the city. Later, it was moved to Constantinople, where it stayed till 1204, when the crusaders from the west sacked the city and looted everything that was portable. It may have gone to France with them. A relic there was identified with the miraculous image of Edessa. If so, it was lost during the French Revolution. But back to Abgar, the king historians know as Abgar V. If he really did become a Christian, then his successors lapsed back into paganism. Nevertheless, Christianity took firm root in Edessa before the time of Constantine, so that Eusebius, writing in the early 300s, could end the story of Abgar by saying, And even to this day, the whole of Edessa is devoted to the name of Christ. By the time of Eusebius, Edessa was a city at the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, not far from the border with the powerful Persian or Parthian Empire. Today, it's still an important city in Turkey. Today, it's called Urfa. Ancient Edessans mostly spoke Syriac, a language we've heard about before. Syriac began as the Edessan dialect of Aramaic, the language Jesus and his disciples spoke in everyday life. Through the influence of Edessa, the Syriac language would become, to the Eastern Church, what Latin is to the Western Church, the universal language of religion and literature. Churches as far away as southern India use Syriac as the language of liturgy. They still do. One of the first big names in Edessa's Christian history is Bardaisan. He was a Gnostic heretic who founded a sect known as the Bardaisanites. Bardaisan died in the year 222. Although he was a heretic, his influence on Edessa's Christian culture was big. He was especially famous for his hymns in the Syriac language, and as we'll see, conveying theology through song would be an important part of the Edessan Christian tradition. A later Orthodox theologian was forced to admit that Bardaisan had talent. He said, Ye sons of the good God, pray for Bardaisan, for in his heathenism there went a legion in his heart, but our Lord in his mouth. End of quote. 
That praise came from no less a man than St. Ephraim the Syrian, whom we'll meet in just a moment. Edessa suffered greatly in the persecution of Diocletian, the last and worst of the Roman persecutions. As the historian J.B. Siegel points out, the struggle was not just between Christian and pagan, but between Edessans and their Roman rulers. If Eusebius is right about the city being mostly Christian in his time, then the Christian population in Edessa was already large by the time of Diocletian. The martyrologies tell us that pagan and Jewish inhabitants of the city also paid their respects to the courage of the martyrs. Edessa might belong to the Roman Empire, but it remembered when it was its own kingdom and kept an independent streak. In fact, as a Christian center, Edessa got a big boost from one of the greatest disasters to the Roman Empire. We've heard about Julian the Apostate before. He was the emperor who tried to take the Roman Empire back to his fantasy of the pagan good old days. He led an army into Persia and at first had some success. But the Persians wore him down, and at last he was killed far inside enemy territory. The soldiers picked Jovian as his successor, and Jovian made a disastrous deal with the Persians that gave up all Rome's easternmost provinces in exchange for the Persians letting his army out alive. One of the cities in those provinces was Nisibis, the great fortress of the Eastern Empire and an important center of Christianity. The Christian citizens of Nisibis were forced to pack up and leave on short notice. Many settled in Edessa, including one who would come to be known as the most important theologian and writer in Syriac Christianity, St. Ephraim, known in the West as St. Ephraim the Syrian, or St. Ephraim the Deacon. The thing that made Ephraim so popular was that he made theology fun. Other Christians wrote tracts carefully explaining the truth to the intellectuals who could read and understand them. Ephraim set the truth to music so you could walk down the street singing it. With the true poet's sense of metaphor, he could look at a pearl and see the whole mystery of the incarnation. He would sing, What are you like? Let your stillness speak to one who hears you. Talk to us with your silent mouth. Whoever hears your halting silence sees the image of our Redeemer. Your mother is a virgin of the sea. Your fair conception was without seed, and your generation without intercourse, and your birth without brothers. Your beauty is a shadowy image of the beauty of the Son who clothed himself with suffering when the nails passed through him. They handled you roughly when the all passed through you, just as they did his hands. And because of his sufferings, he was a king. Just as because of your sufferings, your beauty is increased. St. Ephraim got himself noticed among the Greek-speaking Christians, too. Here's what the ancient Greek-speaking historian Sozomen has to say about him. Ephraim the Syrian was entitled to the highest honors and was the greatest ornament of the church. He was a native of Nisibis, or of the neighboring territory. He devoted his life to monastic philosophy, and although he received no instruction, he became, contrary to all expectation, so proficient in the learning and language of the Syrians that he comprehended with ease the most abstruse theorems of philosophy. His style of writing was so full of splendid oratory and sublimity of thought that he surpassed all the writers of Greece. If the works of those Greek writers were to be translated into Syriac or any other language, and the beauties of the Greek language taken away from them, they would keep little of their original elegance and value. Ephraim's productions do not have this disadvantage. They were translated into Greek during his life, and translations are even now being made, and yet they preserve much of their original force and power, so that his works are not less admired when read in Greek than when read in Syriac. Basil, who was subsequently bishop of the metropolis of Cappadocia, was a great admirer of Ephraim, and was astonished at his erudition. I think the opinion of Basil, who was the most learned and eloquent man of his age, is a stronger testimony to the merit of Ephraim than anything that could be written in his praise. Well, since it was near the eastern frontier, 
Edessa was always in danger from any ambitious Persian emperor who wanted to teach the Romans a lesson. More than once the city was besieged. The historian Procopius tells us that the anti-Christian Persian emperor Khosros went after Edessa specifically because of that prophecy, the one that said no enemy would ever overtake it. Here's what he says. Then a sort of ambition came over Khosros to capture the city of Edessa, for he was led on to this by a saying of the Christians, and it kept irritating his mind, because they maintained that it could not be taken for the following reason, and so on. From here, Procopius gives us the story of Abgar, including the correspondence with Jesus. Here's what Procopius says. Here's how he tells it. When the Christ saw this message... He wrote in reply to Abgar, saying distinctly that he would not come, but promising him health in the letter. And they say that he added this also, that never would the city be liable to capture by the barbarians. This final portion of the letter was entirely unknown to those who wrote the history of that time, for they did not even make mention of it anywhere. But the people of Edessa say that they found it with the letter, so that they have even caused the letter to be inscribed in this form on the gates of the city instead of any other defense. End of quote. This account is all the more interesting because the sober and unsuperstitious Procopius doesn't really believe the legend. Here's what he says. And the thought once occurred to me, that if Christ did not write this thing just as I have told it, since people have come to believe in it, Christ wishes to guard the city uncaptured for this reason, so that he may never give them any pretext for error. As for these things, then, let them be as God wills, and so let them be told. As Procopius tells us, Cosros failed more than once. The city still had not been taken in the middle 500s when Procopius was writing. But whether it was divine or just lucky, the city's protection would not last forever. Like the rest of the Christian East, Edessa fell under Muslim domination. It was a frequent flashpoint for battles between Christian and Muslim powers, and became the center of one of the Crusader states in the late Middle Ages. The city still had a large Christian population until the 20th century, when most of the Christians were driven out by massacres and political changes. Today, Orfa is known as one of the most religious cities in Turkey, but the religion is Islam. The influence of ancient Edessa, however, is still felt throughout the Christian East, where Syriac is still the language of Christianity. And wherever in the world Syriac Christians have gone, they have brought with them the glorious tradition of Edessa, the blessed city. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Way of the Fathers, and if you did, I ask you to consider making a donation to help us. We're entirely listener-funded, and so we're utterly dependent on you. So please go now to our form at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Send us your gift and let us know that you love the fathers. And remember, we pray for our listeners and benefactors every day. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant filium dei Way of the Fathers is a production of catholicculture.org Check out our other podcasts, including Catholic Culture Audiobooks, bringing to life classic Catholic writings. Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective. And the Catholic Culture Podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and much more at catholicculture.org.